For two years, the Spotlight team worked on the series The Troubles, A Secret History, revisiting some of the seismic moments of The Troubles. We also came across pivotal events, enormously significant at the time, but hardly scrutinized since. Like the killings of three young Scottish soldiers, found shot dead, their bodies dumped in North Belfast. You think it's a turning point, the three Scottish soldiers? They are among the first soldiers to be killed in the conflict. And it enrages the, the military. And it's forgotten about now, of course, but the three soldiers is... Three soldiers is still huge. something, if you were alive at the time, you remember it because it was front page. We need to bring a name to it. We have a fair degree of knowledge of that, and we're following that at the moment as we speak. It soon became clear that this story, like many others, demanded more time and space to tell properly. Tonight, finally, the results of our investigation completed just days ago. The first months of 1971. Killings were just starting to become routine in the Troubles. Then, in the second week of March, the discovery of the bodies of three young Scottish soldiers on the outskirts of North Belfast seemed to push the boundaries of violence to a new extreme. I was walking through the field and I heard shooting. A lot of shots. The three dead soldiers are still lying in halfway in a ditch up there. And by the bodies, which I'm told are heaped on each other, are beer glasses. I didn't know why it was three Protestants, or I didn't know why it was three Catholics, but I never jumped it was three soldiers. There was nothing to indicate that it was three soldiers. 23-year-old Dougald McCaughey was shot dead with brothers Joseph and John McCaig. Joseph was 18, with John, the youngest of the soldiers, just 17. The wee boy had loads of freckles on his face, I remember that. There was blood still running through the wee boy's eyes, because I, I actually put my hand on the wee boy's face, and he was warm. He wasn't cold, like. He definitely wasn't cold, he was warm. The off-duty soldiers had been drinking in a city centre pub before being lured to their deaths by members of the IRA. We just shot and dumped on top of each other. The troops on duty at first believed the dead men were civilians. In the beginning, they were merely acting as guards for the IUC detectives at the scene. But then the papers on the bodies identified them as soldiers. The news spread to the troops and their anger was immediately apparent. The killing of off-duty soldiers was unprecedented. By this time, only three soldiers had been killed by the IRA. This is not the sort of thing we're used to, and these were three decent, ordinary, young soldiers doing a, a difficult job, cheerfully and courageously. At the time, the IRA denied involvement. That was a lie. But to this day, nobody has been held to account for the killings. The killings would have an enduring impact in Belfast and beyond, but they tore the heart out of the families of the soldiers. At the time and since, they've said little publicly about what happened. But I have found a radio interview with Dougald McCaughey's mom, Elizabeth, recorded shortly after the news was broken to her. Last night. 
loved up. I loved up. He didn't get a chance to fight that. I don't even know what happened to him. I don't know whether he was fighting or anything. That's all I know. He was supposed to be off duty for a couple of hours and then went out like any normal boy would do. And then he was fighting. I don't even know what happened to him. The mother's grief. One minute she's reading a lovely letter home written by her other son who also served here in Belfast about Dougald. And the next minute she's hearing he's been shot dead. Public shock at the killings turned to anger. Thousands of the largely Protestant workforce at Harland and Wolf joined a huge protest march. The call was for internment. The security forces know the men in this town that has the guns and are using them. And they can very easily go out and lift them and put them where they should belong. The whole of Scotland was shaken by the killings, bewilderment at how three of their lads had been sacrificed in Northern Ireland. Scotland mourns her three murdered soldiers. And they're named John and Joseph McCaig, the two boys. And the middle, Dougal Mackay. A 50,000 pounds reward is put up to catch the killers. By Saturday, that's th three days after the killing, it's been reported that there's a ban on sending soldiers under the age of 18 to, uh, to Northern Ireland, into combat zones, essentially. Come Hello. on, Dee, you bomb in here. Tommy, how are you? Thanks very you. much, lovely to meet you. Tommy Anderson served in the Royal Highland Fusiliers with Dougald, Joseph and John. He never left Belfast and now lives a mile away from where they were killed. Well, you know why I want to talk to you, don't you? Yeah, I do. That day, they'd walked together from Girdward Barracks in North Belfast to enjoy a day out in the city centre. How many of you? There were six. And we just walked along the Hunter Road chatting as usual, carrying on, and then we went down into the town. And we go as far as Royal Avenue. We split then? Yeah, we split. Um, Two Dougal, groups of three. All right, Dougal, Joseph and John went over to the post office. To get some money out? To get some money from the bank book. They never turned up to come to the bar, you know, where we were drinking. They must have went somewhere else. He was back in barracks when news broke that evening. Just after eight, platoon commander came in. And we could see there was something wrong because Lieutenant McGregor's eyes were red round, round the outside. And he was standing there and we were asking him, what's wrong? He couldn't, he never told, he wouldn't tell us. Then the company commander came in. He told us what had happened, but the three boys were found dead up in Leganeo. I felt wrong, so did my mate Donna Lethem. He says, should we have done something else? Should we have went looking for him? We should, you know what I mean? And it was going through our minds and Donna saying, look, if we say it, if we thought it was nice, we're going to talk to ourselves. A little while later, Tommy Anderson was helping bury his friends. We were told to go up to the graveside one at a time, and that was the hardest part for me. Because when you went up there, you were standing facing the families. And the families were breaking their heart. You don't actually look at the coffin, you know what I mean? You're saluting to your front. But when you're saluting to the front, you're saluting at the family because they're there watching you doing this. And they're all crying, you know what I mean? And they're all hugging each other. And it was heartbreaking, you know what I mean? So you saluted, and while I was saluting, the tears just 
They couldn't stop, they just came out. The killings were a turning point for many soldiers on the streets and for their relationship with nationalists. Naturally, in a situation like this, um, people are going to get hurt, I'm afraid. I think there was no one man in my platoon that didn't want to throw everybody in Northern Ireland, and I mean everybody. because these were our mates, our brothers, you know. Tommy's daughter, Donna, was born five months after the soldiers were killed, but she sees herself almost as their guardian angel and is utterly devoted to their memory. Uh, this photo here is, has been text myself, taken in her where John and Joseph are buried. This is their grave. This house, this room, in a sense, is something of a shrine to them, isn't it? It is kind of a shrine to them because, you know, I've lived it for a long time with my dad. So why are you doing this? Why? Yeah. I do it for my dad. My dad, as you know, was one of the boys out with him that day. Um, he's getting old and he can't, he can't stand even at the memorial, so I do it. I'm now, if he, when he always says, if he goes, I take his, I take his place. So he knows that it'll continue on. It's not lost in history. Like myself, I have my eight-year-old daughter now. She goes up, she lays a wreath. Um, it's heartbreaking to watch the families going through it. It's just at the end of the day, it's closure. They need closure. Do we not know, basically, the facts are members of the IRA took the three, uh, three young soldiers up to Lake and shot them dead? Mm -hmm. Why do we need to know more? And what more do we need to know? We need to know who did it. We need to know someone to claim it. No one claimed it. And the way they fell, you know, and just left there like garbage. It's horrible to, for a family to know, you know, my son isn't here anymore. I don't know the truth. You know, how do we get around the truth? Well, it's pushing forward. Yeah. It has to be. It has to be. Yeah. Somebody has to know something. Our own investigation begins properly when we meet a former murder detective who did a complete review of the case in 2010. Dave Hoare, who would make an important contribution to the series The Troubles A Secret History, knows more about these killings than just about anyone. Dave, how are you? Listen, you're a star. Oh, hello, Dara. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks you. very much for coming. Uh, I've got a coffee for you. Thank you. The first sighting of them um, was at about half past two that afternoon in the Abercorn Bar. Well, that's, I think, on Castle Lane. Yes, that that's right, yeah. And then the next sighting of them uh, is in Mooney's Bar. And in there, they were seen talking uh, with two men. The description of one of the men closely fitted Patrick McAdory, who was a member of the Ardoin IRA. And he senior had, member of the IRA. Yes. Yeah. To this day, many believe that women were used to lure the soldiers to their deaths. A honey trap. I'm hoping Dave Hoare will clarify this while taking me to a key location from that fateful evening. What's the significance of Kelly Sellers in the story then? Well, Kelly Sellers is the last pub that the three soldiers visited and that this was the last sighting of the three soldiers alive. A lot of talk over the years that this was some sort of a honey trap. Yeah. Was this a honey trap? There was no evidence whatsoever that they were in the uh, company of women. To my mind, it's an urban myth until somebody can bring up some fresh evidence. They, they were drinking with the two suspects and then a third, man, a, th a third suspect arrived and uh, he seemed to have bought a car to, to take them away and they were seen to leave the pub. The youngest of the, uh, of the soldiers, who was uh, John McCaig, was heard to say that he wanted to take a uh, Joe Baxi, which is a slang for a taxi. And this was at, this was at t turn six o'clock 
and uh, it's obvious that in the meantime he was persuaded to go with the other two. Remember, by 6.30, they were absent without leave from Girdwood, Girdwood Barracks, and you can, only, you can only speculate that the effects of the alcohol in them caused the misjudgment, and they, they didn't return to the barracks, they went with the man. Next, Dave Hoare takes me to where the soldiers were shot. All three of them had been shot with gunshot wounds to the head. The front of the trousers were open, and which indicated that they'd stopped at the side of the road to urinate. And if they, did, they had, you can imagine that they'd be facing this fence. And they were all shot from behind. And from around here at the scene, there were three beer glasses recovered. From looking at the material that I reviewed, I don't think they knew what was happening. It was a, to a totally callous and cowardly murder. The IRA in North Belfast, its so-called 3rd Battalion, was relentlessly efficient at killing members of the security forces in 1971. Twelve soldiers and four policemen were killed by the year's end. The Metropolitan Police, which was called in to help the beleaguered RUC, identified suspects for the three Scots killings very quickly. They identified four suspects. Who were the suspects? They were Patrick McAdory, Anthony Dutch Doherty, Suspect 1 and uh, Suspect 2. So Patrick McAdory, we know now certainly yeah. that he was one of the, the top IRA men in, yeah. in North Belfast. Yes. What happened to him? He was, he was killed by the British Army in the Ardoin on August the 9th, the day internment broke out. So McAdory is now yeah. literally out of the picture? Yes. But there's three other suspects yes. out there. The police thought they had a big break when they arrested one of their suspects later that year, Anthony Dutch Doherty. He was interviewed by the Metropolitan Police and the report says that Doherty made full confessions to his involvement in the murder of the three soldiers and he named his accomplices. Anthony Dutch Doherty was then interned at Crumlin Road Jail while the hunt for the other suspects continued. But he was hardly inside when he joined a jailbreak. Then on December the 2nd, he escaped. It was one of the biggest propaganda blows to the security forces since the emergency began. Normally, researching someone going back almost 50 years is quite difficult, but that's not the case with Anthony Dutch Doherty. Looking through our own archives, it seems that for a period at least, he was among the best-known Republicans in the land, rarely out of the news. In fact, just days after that jailbreak, he and fellow escapee Martin Meehan turned out to be the star turns at a press conference organised by the IRA south of the border. The star attractions escape from a Belfast jail. They're among the most wanted IRA men in Ulster. When we were arrested on the 9th of November, the brutality that I suffered, and Tony here suffered, before the interrogation. We felt like Dan just before it. We got that big a beating. In fact, I said... The one Meehan was, in fact, later awarded compensation for his injuries, and investigators discovered that Doherty's confession was inadmissible. A judge found that the process of interrogation at the time meant admissions couldn't be regarded as voluntary. And because Doherty's contaminated statement was the only real evidence against himself and one other, suspect two, it meant investigators were left with no case against both. The police still wanted to question Doherty about the three Scots and to charge him for alleged weapons offences. News reports followed their protracted efforts to extradite him to face those charges. But Doherty eventually beat off the extradition warrant, as he explained from Dublin in 1975. Well, the appeal that it, that it was uh, a political 
case. And they had no right to send me back north. Would you say shooting at security forces was a political offence? Yeah, it was. Well, I was there to protect the minority people, and the security forces were coming in. And, well, they, they were shooting, so they were. So the only thing you have to do is shoot back to defend your people. That's Anthony Dutch Doherty 45 years ago. There's a certain irony that it's almost easier to find him decades ago than it is to find him today. Looking for him involves speaking to his friends from back in the day, finding and persuading members of his extended family to speak to me. I mean, he could be dead. I, I just don't know. I did get one break recently when I found a Facebook page suggesting that he has close family in Dublin. So that sounds like a good place to start. I was many months into the investigation and convinced he was dead when I knocked on one last door in Belfast and was put right. Turns out Anthony Dutch Doherty is not dead. He's very much alive and he's living in Dublin and I'm on my way to see if I can speak to him right now. Thanks to Facebook, I do at least know what he looks like. It's been an interesting day in Dublin. Uh, I have uh, confirmed that Dutch Doherty is very much alive. I've spoken to Dutch Doherty. But he won't speak to me. He says he has nothing to say about what he did or didn't do all those years ago. From the start, police had four suspects. Paddy McAdory, who's dead. Anthony Dutch Doherty, alive, but he won't speak to us and two others whose names we didn't have. We knew them simply as Suspect 1 and Suspect 2. But we now believe we know who Suspect 2 is. Police and other sources tell us his name is Harry Canavan. I believe Harry Canavan was a member of the IRA almost from the very start, the provisional IRA, back in 1969. And according to the police, this Harry Canavan, he went on the run in 1971, shortly after the killings of the three soldiers. We have traced a Harry Canavan to an address south of the border, but we won't be able to put any questions relating to the investigation to him because he's dead. He died in the village where he lived a number of years ago. So that just leaves suspect one. In many ways, I think suspect one is the most interesting character in all this story. The police put a name to him very early on, and the reason why is because a work colleague, who was a postman, came into the pub and spotted him drinking in the corner with the three soldiers. He came over to have a chat with him, but Suspect One shooed him away. Suspect One's name, Paddy O'Kane. Now, I have a file here, which I think explains why the three soldiers appeared very comfortable in Paddy O'Kane's company. These are Paddy O'Kane's army records. Paddy O'Kane was a member of the Parachute Regiment. And in here, you see when he joined, 1957, when he left, 1964. You see his service record, Cyprus, Jordan, you see that when he left, his military conduct was rated as very good. And this here is a photograph, it's a rare photograph we have of him, of Paddy O'Kane back in the late 50s, we think, with two para boxing team. And that's him here. You can almost see them in your mind's eye, the, the old soldier and the young recruits, all soldiers together, sitting down, supping a drink in a corner of the pub. 
he was 36 years of age. So slightly fatherly figure. You can imagine the soldiers feeling totally comfortable in his company as he regales them with tales of his army exploits. And them feeling not just comfortable, but perfectly safe. Safe enough to get in a car with him and others and drive to what maybe was sold to them as a party or another pub in North Belfast. The man I'm going to see now knew and liked Paddy O'Kane when they were both in the IRA. I first met Des Long while making the Secret History series. A founding member of the Provisional IRA, he is still wedded to the cause. Hi, Des. I'm Dara. Dara. How are you? How are you? The very best. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Congratulations to yourself. Not bad. Surviving, I suppose. Ah, surviving, yeah. Same as everybody else. Sit down. You're a committed, lifelong Republican. Oh, like the, the Republic hasn't been won yet. Tell us a little bit of Paddy O'Kane, if you can. Yeah, I knew him by reputation. But I know certainly he was a British commando, and he fought in Cyprus, and he was involved in the training of people in the RPGs. These rocket propelled grenades had been smuggled in yeah. and then Paddy O'Kane was taken down to Tipperary to train yes, right. IRA men and how to, how to use them. Yeah. And he knew how to use them. How, how did he know how to use them? Because he had found them, I think. When he was in the, in yeah, the yeah. army? Yeah. Was Paddy good at that oh, part he of training? Was, he was first class, he was first class training officer. But I don't think he was particularly liked by some of his Comrades, don't ask me why I know that or why I think that. I, I, I believe that uh, he, was, he was an out-and-out -out soldier. Maybe that didn't suit the politicians. And I knew he was on the run because uh, he, he uh, the shooting of three, police, uh, three British soldiers in uh, Belfast. He, he believed he was involved in that. But that particular killing, um, a set of killings, Many people see it as particularly horrendous because two of the there are two brothers. One was only seventeen. The other guy, the third man killed, was was uh, twenty three years of age. They were they were drinking, and they were taken away by the IRA. Well, we spoke that about th that. Flev only seventeen was trained by the British Army to kill Irish people. For his age doesn't make any difference. He was there as a British soldier to carry out the work of the Brits, and all this thing. The, 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 the do-gooders, oh, lovely fellow, he shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have been in our country as an army, a part of the army of occupation. And that's what they were, members of the army of occupation. But is there not a difference when, say, you're, like, uh, it, the, the soldiers were shot in Belfast, when they were on patrol, look, when look, they were... Look, Let them stay in their barracks. I think it, it, it was a marker to the Brits. You're not going around walking around here. He was a member, you know, pa 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 Paddy was a member of the SAS. I don't know. No, he was. He was. Was a, was a member of the parachute regiment. He was. Oh, yeah. he was a parachute. That's why yeah. he was a member of. The, uh, I know that, but he had changed his life. How would it have been for him? Do you think here he is, like a former soldier, taking these three so soldiers out to be, to shoot them? I suppose he was trained to kill. I don't know. I never spoke to him about it. I'd be honest with you. They were the enemy, I mm. suppose. End of story. End of story, yeah. The Des Long is pretty certain that Paddy O'Kane is dead. What I now know is that sometime in the mid-70s, O'Kane left Dundalk where he had been living and moved to Shannon, a couple of hundred miles south. This isn't a big town, I think we'll find Paddy O'Kane's family if they're here pretty quickly. I think um, whether it be through door knocking or just talking to people or tip off from somebody or whether we, whether one of our phone calls to some of the community representatives pays off, I think we'll find him, I think we'll find him by the day's end. It's been quite an extraordinary day. I went to the Shannon town uh, confident that I would find uh, the family of Paddy O'Kane, find out a little bit more about him. 
But after only three or four houses knocked on this particular door and two men answered and they turned out to be the sons of Paddy O'Kane. Now we'd knocked on this door completely by chance. They told me that their dad had in fact died as we thought back in 2009. Um, they told me that he had spoken once to them, at least once to them, of the killings of the three Scottish soldiers. And he hadn't been boasting about it, nor was he expressing deep regret. He had told them simply matter-of-factly what had happened. Um, tellingly, I think, um, one of the brothers said to me, one of the sons said to me that before he died, and he knew he was dying because he had cancer, Paddy O'Kane instructed that there be no Republican trappings at his funeral, that his funeral would be that of an ordinary citizen, not that of an IRA volunteer. Somewhere in here, it's Paddy O'Kane's final resting place. Here's Paddy. I think this is it here. You can make out Kane there. It's Paddy O'Kane. Birthday, 18th of September, 1935. His death, 25th of March 2009. There's no sense here whatsoever of his IRA past, of what he did and what he's alleged to have done. Just ordinary Paddy O'Kane. But he left some mayhem in his wake. We began hoping to find out who had killed the three soldiers. Now we have proof of the role of one man, Paddy O'Kane, the ex-para who had shared a drink with the three Scots before leading them to their deaths. I want to know more about the man who did this, so I'm meeting somebody else who knew O'Kane personally. Dublin solicitor Kieran Conway. In his IRA days, he would become its director of intelligence, but early on, O'Kane was his boss. Can you remember when you heard first about the killings of the three yeah, soldiers? The, the first I would have heard was either on the radio or on the newspaper um, uh, when I was in London. I was a member of the IRA at the time. I saw that the IRA denied it. Was um, you know very pleased with that because it was an operation that um, well it wasn't an operation. It was a murder, you know, an execution uh, that I disapproved of, uh, particularly in view of the age of the soldiers and um, you know that kind of thing. I believe that soldiers should only be targets when they were in uniform, armed and on the streets. But the IRA did it. Oh, it? the IRA did it. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Yeah. How did you find that out? I found that out when I, uh, you know, when I came home, and uh, was associated with uh, Paddy O'Kane, because Paddy was perfectly open about it. What did Paddy tell you? Uh, he told me he was um, that he uh, that he um, killed soldiers. And just matter of factly? Yeah, just like that, yep. And how did you respond? I mean, he would have been senior to you, I think. Yeah, oh, no, he was very senior to me. I didn't respond at all, you know. I just, uh, you know, acknowledged what I'd heard. That was it. The, I think the um, killing of the Scottish soldiers showed definite psychopathic tendencies. Was he a psychopath, yeah? Uh, I believe so, yeah. I, I believe any man that could execute three young Scottish soldiers in that manner. Um, must have been a psychopath. Based just south of the border, O'Kane is believed to have stayed with the IRA for at least another five years. In terms of numbers, this was, quite simply, the worst sectarian attack of its sort in six and a half years of violence in Northern Ireland. The ten men who were gunned down as they stood beside their minivan all died from multiple wounds. The King's Mill Massacre, January 1976. Ten Protestants were ordered off the work bus and shot dead by the IRA. You see, I grew up with these lads. I knew them all. They're all local lads. Oh, 
ten fellas just wiped to the face of the earth from someone that had never known trouble. That was that was the hardest to take. That was a real that was a real pain. Just as with the killings of the three Scottish soldiers, the IRA never admitted responsibility. The killings had something else in common. A chief suspect, a former member of the Parachute Regiment, Paddy O'Kane. This here is a report carried out by the Historical Inquiries team. It's about 10 years old. But here we have Paddy O'Kane listed as suspectee. Three former police officers have confirmed to me that Paddy O'Kane and Suspect E here in this report are the one and the same. Now what this means is that Paddy O'Kane, the man who we have established was centrally involved in the killings of the three Scottish soldiers, was also a lead suspect in one of the most horrendous sectarian killings of the entire Troubles. We did raise this with his family and remember that they were candid about their father's role in the killings back in 1971 but they said they knew nothing of any allegations connecting their dad to King's Mill. But they did tell us something else. They told us that back in 2007, their father received what's come to be known as an on-the-run letter. Now, that's not an amnesty. What it is, is it's an acknowledgement by the authorities that the recipient, in this case, Paddy O'Kane, is not, at that point, wanted by any police force in the United Kingdom. Paddy O'Kane would go on to live out the rest of his life a free man. In the final days of our investigation, one important and significant letter arrives. So an email has just come in here from a man who I think is the solicitor for Anthony Dutch Doherty. Now, we had written to uh, Doherty after we had approached him and we asked him, notwithstanding the fact that he didn't want to speak to us, did he have any uh, comment to make on um, what we were planning to say about him, which is that he was a suspect in the killing of the three soldiers. Now, this is the letter here. This is the key thing here. Um, our client, Anthony Dutch Doherty, vehemently denies any involvement in the murders mentioned in your correspondence and takes grave exception to your communication so there you have it. Um, Anthony Dutch Doherty, through his lawyer, is absolutely denying any involvement in the killings of the three soldiers. I think today is pretty much the last leg of our journey with this story. I'm going to speak to some of the relatives of the three soldiers. I feel it's important that they know as much as we do about what happened to the three soldiers all those years ago. They don't want to go on camera, they've never wanted to go on camera, but they do want a briefing and I'm here today to do that, to let them know as much as I can about what happened that night all those years ago. The McCaig family were happy to share these pictures of John and Joseph. So I met the McCaig family last night and I gave them a briefing on what we knew, laid out as many facts as we had gathered and they were keen to hear them. But at the end of it, they made clear one thing, that as far as they are concerned, events of that night can never be undone. They will never have any closure. Dougald McCaughey's surviving brother said simply, Every death in the Troubles has left families the same way. Yeah, I welcome you all to this annual service here at Bally Selling Avenue this afternoon. 
As you remember with pride, thanksgiving and sorrow, the lives of Fusiliers, John McCaig, Joseph McCaig and Dougal McCaughan. I know there's more to come out that was probably hard to hear, but it warms my heart that we know we're getting closer to maybe getting something. The closer we get, the happier I get. I mean, uh, every time I talk about it, it comes back, you know what I mean? People didn't realise that when you serve a guy for so long, it doesn't matter how long it is, you become brothers. As more emerges about the killings, there have been calls for a fresh inquest and a new investigation. But according to police, the clearest evidence has always been against Paddy O'Kane, who is dead. This case may be no different to so many others in the Troubles. If justice means jailing the perpetrators, justice will most likely remain elusive.